Welcome. Well, you are at home with Jim and Joy, and today is the first month, well, it's the first Monday in the third week of Advent. That's right. And yes, Christmas is approaching. It's coming sooner and sooner. The great blessings of all that we're excited about. And, um, but you know, one of the things about the beauty of this season is, you know, we're all excited about family coming and people being with family members and all of that. But you know, it's also a, a painful time of the year for lots of our viewers at home. And because, um, you know, life and death happen during the Christmas season. You would think like, oh no, it's Christmas, people can't die, or we, we shouldn't be suffering, we shouldn't, you know, this shouldn't be happening, as if like there's, this is this carved out time and space. Mm -hmm. um, but death is never timely or convenient, and it's rude. It's straight out rude and painful, and um, and you know I'm discussing sharing a, a friend, a beautiful young mother, of three beautiful children, had a, a serious cancer, um, and um, just terrible. And you think, why, why, Lord, your father died putting up a Christmas tree, um, and so we suffer. And we ache and we hurt and it doesn't seem fair and this shouldn't be happening, but it happens. And what is the church, what are, what are we, when we go to church this Sunday, right? We went to church on Sunday and we're hearing these readings about rejoicing in the Lord. And you're like, rejoice in the Lord. I'm, I'm suffering. I'm sad. I'm hurting. How do, how do I respond? And only in faith can we do that, right? Right. Because in all of our trials, in all of our sufferings, in all of our heartaches, to Christ alone can we go. Right. And um, it doesn't mean you're going to get an answer. It doesn't mean your cancer is going to go away. It doesn't mean your loved one's going to come back. But we have the faith to cope, um, to believe, to hope, even through our sufferings, as terrible as they may be, we have to hope in Christ yes. because even death, does not have the victory, right? Mm -hmm. With Christ, we believe and we hope, and we're going to come through this time. So I just really wanted to share that with a lot of our viewing audience, because so many people we're hearing from who are hurting, um, and it happens, and we need to run to the church, we need to run to the truth, we need to run to the Word of God in yeah. that. Well, I love the uh, New Testament lesson for Gaudete Joy Sunday. It said, Rejoice in the Lord always and again I'll say it and I think Paul is writing from jail right I think it's a suffering place his life's under threat and again I say it rejoice why the Lord's at hand this is Advent the Lord's at hand nativity Christ is coming the Lord's at hand rejoice in him let your supplications and your petitions be made known to God and then that the peace of God that passes all understanding it'll keep your heart and your mind in the knowledge and love of Christ Jesus, our Lord. Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. We want you to be a part of the show. We're going to be sharing with Jim Blackburn, who is an apologist, the defender of the faith, and we're focusing upon marriage. Any question regarding marriage? What is marriage? What does marriage do? What is sacramental marriage? What is a valid marriage? Questions regarding divorce, remarriage. Uh, and so on. Any question you have in the area of marriage, Jim will do his best to field it. Give us a call, 205-271-2980, or toll-free, 800-221-9460, or jimandjoy at EWTN.com. You're an important part of the EWTN family. We're going to take a break, and we'll be right back. Please don't go away.
freedom and joy. And we are excited that you are there, and we want you to be a an important part of this show, so give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll-free 1-800-221-9460. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, today is a very important day. We have a great guest yet again for you. We have this lovely man who's come all the way from California, Jim Blackburn. Now, Jim is an author, a speaker, an apologist, but I want Jim to explain, to, to tell him, let him share about who he is and what he brings to us today. So Jim Blackburn, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Thank you so much for having me. Well, one of the, one of, I think your greatest traits is that you're a father of triplets. Now, aren't too many men who sit on this couch and there you are, you stood the test, you done did good. So tell us Thank about you. your marriage, your wife, where you're from, and what you got going on. It, one of the biggest blessings in my life. And yeah, I've been married for 26 and a half years, and uh, a little over 23 years ago, found out we found out we were having triplets, mm -hmm. two boys and a girl. Uh, mm -hmm. It's been just a wonderful blessing. So it's, in fact, they'll be turning 23 on December 28th. Uh -huh. We were talking backstage because, you know, Joy and I are blessed with a a set of identical twins, and my brother has identical twins. We have a lot of twins in the family. And I was sharing with you that we were told twice through Joy's pregnancy process that we were having triplets, and then they would change it to twins. And I, I was sharing with you that when they said twins, I, I kind of handled that okay. But when they said triplets, I, really, I was surprised. I was speechless. My legs were wobbling. <laughs> It was just unusual. I mean, never mind, she's going to carry triplets, right? But for me as a guy, and uh, it's just something to be told you can have three or maybe more children, isn't it? It, it, takes, <laughs> it takes a little bit of getting used to, that's for yeah. sure. It, it really, uh, for us, it was a, a shock, mm -hmm. but at the same time, just couldn't imagine how much of a blessing mm -hmm. this was yeah. going to be in our lives. Absolutely. And, and, and certainly has been. Uh, I'm an identical twin. Yeah. And yeah, my that's wife's right. mother's a twin, so we've mm -hmm. got twins on both sides. You got that multiple birth thing going. That's right. Mm -hmm. Bless your heart. Thank you. Well, now tell us about what it is that you do and how you got to do what you do. You're born and raised Catholic, mm -hmm. right? That's so right. tell us your story. Well, I, just like a probably a typical Catholic, uh, many years ago I was uh, uh, just living my faith as, as a Catholic, but I probably couldn't have told you why I was a Catholic. Mm -hmm. I, I just I always had been. Uh, and then one day, you know, back in the days of the Sony Walkman radios. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I had gotten one of those for Christmas, and I was at the gym, and I couldn't get any stations on it. So I threw it back in my gym bag, got back on the treadmill, and a few minutes later, a woman walks up, and she has the exact same radio on, mm -hmm. and she's obviously listening to something, mm -hmm. and she's really enjoying it. So I, I got her attention. I, I can't get any stations on mine. What are you mm -hmm. listening to? And she said, uh, Christian radio. She mm -hmm. told me the local Christian radio station. And she asked me, are you a Christian? And I said, well, yeah, I'm a Catholic. And she looked at me and said, Catholics aren't Christians. Mm. Wow. And that moment mm. was the first time I, I realized uh, that not everybody sees Catholics the same way that I do and mm -hmm. that it was a, uh, uh, a, a point, something I needed to learn about. Mm -hmm. And I would go on and have a nice relationship, a working relationship, mm -hmm. actually, with this lady. And, and uh, she was a former Catholic now very much an anti-Catholic, wow. mm -hmm. and she, she kind of tore my faith down, tore my faith apart, because she knew her faith much better than I knew mine. Mm -hmm. So I, uh, I would take her challenges, try to learn as much as I could um, about what the Catholic Church really teaches, and in the process, uh, I actually ended up losing a lot of my faith. Mm -hmm. wow. um, so that got me on the, the, the road to, to looking into this and deciding, you know, is this something that uh, that I believe in or not? Do I believe in God? Mm -hmm. uh, do I believe, do I want to be a Catholic anymore? How, mm. how important is this? Mm. And it, if there's really nothing more important, if God is, is real and he wants to have a relationship with us, there can't be anything more important than life, mm -hmm. really, than, mm -hmm. than to explore that and, and come to know that and embrace it. Uh, so I did. I, I started uh, studying. Mm -hmm. And I would later find out that I, I went through kind of the, street, the three stages of apologetics. Mm -hmm. I, I started by, do I believe in God, mm -hmm. in the existence of God? Uh, and then from there, which God do right. I believe in God? Is it the God of, of uh, this religion or that religion right. or, or this philosophy? 
And then once I, I settled on Christianity being, you know, the God of Christianity being uh, the God, which church? Right. And of course the evidence all in the history all led me, of course, right back to the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. In that process, this became something very passionate for me. Mm -hmm. I, I, and I wanted to share now mm -hmm. what I had learned. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to defend the faith and help other people who may get challenged. Oh, you're, you're, you're a Catholic? Well, you're not a Christian. Right. I want to be able to help people yeah. to be prepared to give a response to that. Right. Oh. Now, this time as you were on this faith journey, right, of truth, Mm -hmm. Were you going to church or you just totally stopped church at all? You just put up the big stop sign and said, I'm not going to do anything until I know what I know. I, I, I did continue going to Mass. Mm -hmm. uh, I did explore other Christian uh, worship services mm -hmm. as well. Mm -hmm. uh, I didn't explore much as far as worship services outside of Christianity other than by studying them. Okay. didn't actually experience them. Okay. But uh, I, I, I did... I guess I never completely moved away from the Catholic Church. Mm -hmm. I just uh, didn't didn't embrace it mm -hmm. as as strongly as I should have. Mm -hmm. And eventually, uh, of course, I, I embraced it as much as I possibly could, and I still do. Mm -hmm. So you now are called a Catholic apologist. What does that mean? Are you apologizing for being Catholic? <laughs> I mean, what does it mean? Explain to our, view, our viewers at home what it means to be a Catholic apologist. Well, uh, apologetics. Uh, is 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 an area where uh, we explain and defend. Mm -hmm. uh, there, if we, if we go back to Scripture and we look at uh, our first Pope's exhortation in First Peter, First Peter three fifteen, he says, "Always be prepared to give a reason for the hope that is in you. you know, do it with gentleness and reverence." And that that reason, always be prepared to give, be prepared to give a reason, comes from the Greek word apologian. Mm -hmm. And that's where we get the word apologetics mm -hmm. and apologist, and and that's again that's what uh, it's what I do as an apologist. Mm -hmm. But that's what we're all called to do. Right. We all should embrace our faith and be prepared mm -hmm. when we're challenged mm -hmm. to to give a response, to give a, a reason. Uh, and we always want to keep in mind the second part of that verse as well. Do it with gentleness and reverence. Mm -hmm. We always want to sh uh, share the faith in that way. Right. Is gentleness and reverence directed to the person you're sharing with, like a reverence or a reverence for God? W what's the reverence part of that? Well, I think both. Uh, I think there have been times in the history of the church where uh, the church has been faced, let's go back to the Reformation, time of the Reformation. The church became very defensive and it, it maintained in theology and it needed to right. because Catholics were attacked. leaving. That's right, Catholics right. were leaving. Mm -hmm. after, after several centuries though, the church still had this very defensive posture mm -hmm. And was finding that its its approach to non-Catholics could tend to sometimes be off-putting, mm -hmm. and Vatican II partly sprung out of this idea that we need to have a, a spirit of ecumenism, a spirit of of dealing with others that is positive, mm -hmm. that helps to bring them into the faith. Mm -hmm. so it's that gentleness and reverence part of it. Mm -hmm. Jim, what is the difference between apologetics? an evangelization or being an apologist or an evangelist? Are there differences or are they the same thing? They're very closely related, okay. uh, but evangelists, I would say, are the ones who they're going out and bringing people to Christ, okay. whereas the apologists are the ones when the, when the church and when the faith is, is challenged, uh, the apologists are the ones who are defending it and, and maybe in some senses keeping people grounded in their faith yeah. and, and helping those who challenge the faith yeah. to understand what the Catholic Church really does teach. Mm -hmm. yeah. uh, there, sometimes the analogy would be used as a sports team. You know, you have a, an offense and a defense. Yeah. Evangelization can be, and, and apologetics can kind of be looked yeah. at that way. And it also mm -hmm. deals with, I guess, preliminary questions, doesn't it? it? You know, to me, like evangelization, I think of the basic proclamation, you know, Jesus has come, he died, he rose, believe, repent, receive baptism. But there may be a question, I don't even know if I believe in God at all. Or mm -hmm. yet there's different questions you kind of, well, in terms of, you've worked with Catholic Answers for like 10 years or so? Yeah, over nine years. Nine years, which is an incredible apostolate dealing with all of these questions. And it's such a tremendous resource. So people are familiar with you via radio. Um, what are the key questions, key areas that Catholics are asking about? Catholics in particular, uh, I found, 
working at Catholic Answers and, and answering questions in the Q&A department over the years, uh, Catholics really, when they're asking questions, uh, it's oftentimes about marriage, mm -hmm. about divorce, about annulments, about receiving the sacraments in whatever state a person might be in mm -hmm. in their lives. And that, to me, w became very apparent early on that these are the questions that Catholics are asking. So I, uh, I, I, I wanted to learn as much as I could about that when I was dealing with Catholics. Um, it, and I want to be able to answer those questions as well. And that's why I uh, have tried to kind of specialize in that a little bit. Mm -hmm. I think that's an area where a lot of Catholics today are just poorly catechized and mm -hmm. don't really understand the church's teaching, uh, the church's laws, uh, God's laws right. oftentimes concerning marriage. Right. It's, it's a huge type of relationship I and mean, it's, it's fundamental to humanity, yet it's something that a lot, a lot of even Catholics know so little about. Well, we know that the Supreme Court has, through law, redefined marriage. We know that that which is absolutely true can't be redefined, but they seem to think they've redefined. But how would you define marriage? Is there a number of ways to do that through the church's view of it versus natural law? Or when we're speaking about marriage, I like to you know, button my button in the right spot. The other day I didn't, I was all crooked, and so I want to go to button it right. So mm -hmm. for me that means what is marriage? What is it? What does it do? How should we understand this as best we can share that? Well, we really need to understand marriage as the relationship that not only that God intended it to be, but, but what reason alone mm -hmm. can tell us that mm -hmm. about, about marriage. It is a man and a woman coming together uh, t for the benefit of each other and, and for raising children, having children and raising children. Uh, it is a, it, it's a lifelong union because you know, families don't stop when the kids mm -hmm. move out. I mean, this is, it should be a lifelong union and it it's, uh, should be ordered towards that giving life. And not just procreation, not just life uh, having children, but also supernatural life. It mm -hmm. should be ordered towards helping each, each other and helping our children get to heaven. Right. And that's a really important aspect of that. That you take it in, right? And we're judged by how we love, and I'm going to be judged by how great he looks and, and all the great and wonderful things I got to teach him and help, helped him to die to himself for and his great outpouring of love to me yeah, and how, me to him. How right? critical marriage is, I think St. John Paul II really has helped me and so many of us to understand more fully this idea of marriage and weddedness and that we're all called in some sense to be married, uh, to be wedded to him. Yes. Um, and so when Joy was saying, you know, it's your, your, your tick, I mean, we're saved through Jesus Christ, but authenticating my love for Christ, I live that out in my weddedness to Joy. And I, I always say, you know, if I don't go to the grave loving one person, this person, we can be in front of millions and millions of people. But if I'm not truly wedded to her until death do us part, until the end, and I persevere till the end, that she's irreplaceable, that this is yeah. permanent, you know, as you were saying, I mean, that, that authenticates my speech regarding my faith in the Lord, and it authenticates what happened to me in the sacrament of baptism and confirmation and so on. I mean, yes. that's the way I see it. Yeah, uh, and that's, it's very important that we, we should look at it. Paul said to husbands, love your wife. Ephesians 5, love your wives as Christ loves the church. Our marriages should be an image of God's relationship with the church. And, and it's the church, uh, God's relationship with the church is, is to give us life, mm -hmm. to lead us to heaven. That's, that's ultimately what, what Christ and the church is about. And that needs to be what uh, husbands and wives really are about too. Not, and not just each other, but our, uh, our, our domestic church, mm -hmm. our families, our children. And, so marriage is, is really important, and it's important, I think, to understand it that way, even when our culture often doesn't. Our culture has, has really destroyed the image of marriage from such a beautiful, life-giving thing uh, to really a very selfish thing oftentimes. And, and I think that it's uh, important that we get back to, and, and help Catholics to get back to, understanding marriage as God intended it. Mm -hmm. So what are you hearing uh, at Catholic Answers, and you have a big part in hearing the questions that are coming in. What are people sharing? Like some of them are questions, they're coming out of their own lives. Well, what's happening in, in the church? What, what are they asking you? Yeah, well, when I, when I give a talk, for example, go out, and, and uh, especially if it's talk, a talk concerning marriage, 
this whole synod, the bishop synod in, in Rome recently is, has brought up a lot of questions mm -hmm. and people are asking about if I'm divorced, can I receive communion? Mm -hmm. If I'm divorced and remarried, can I receive communion? Uh, what is an annulment? How is that different than a divorce? Uh, lots of, of these types of questions, mm -hmm. which, which I think um, Catholics should know the answers mm -hmm. to these. Mm -hmm. The church teaches specifically about these things and, and uh, the answers are there. Right. And, and so Catholics can find out these answers. And we, as the church, we don't get to redefine them or remake them, right? So we have the opportunity to defend the teachings of the church and to tell it even no matter what the Supreme Court says marriage is or marriage is not. Well, what we want to do is you, we want you to have answers to these great questions. And we have a very smart young man here who can help you. So give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll free 1-800-221-9460. You can always send us an email, jimandjoy at ewtn.com. We're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we will have more of this important discussion with Jim Blackburn. Don't go away. with Jim and Joy and we're having a wonderful conversation with Jim Blackburn who seems to have some wonderful answers about our Catholic faith. So if you have questions you can give us a jingle at 205-271-2980 or call us toll free 1-800-221-9460 or send us an email jimandjoy at ewtn.com. Well, I'm going to go straight to the email because you're the man with all the answers. If someone <laughs> is raised Catholic but does not practice and then marries a non-Catholic Christian in an outdoor ceremony, is that considered a sacramental marriage? And this is Dominic from New York. It's a good question. It's actually a common occurrence these days. And, uh, but, but I would point out first that uh, Catholics, even if you've fallen away from the faith. You still have an obligation under the laws of the church to abide by the laws of the church. You know, we, we recognize the laws of the state, the laws of our country. Uh, sometimes it's, it's um, Catholics forget that there are laws of the church as well. And, and they're meant, they come from our church as a mother and they're meant to help us and, and keep us doing what's necessary, what's, what's right. And the church does oblige Catholics to either get married in the Catholic Church or get a permission of some sort of dispensation from the bishop, his bishop, to marry in a, a non-Catholic setting. Um, and that would be without a, a Catholic witness, a Catholic priest or deacon, and without two other witnesses. So sometimes Catholics fail to observe that. It's called the form, the Catholic form of marriage. They fail to observe that. And if they fail to observe that without getting the proper permissions, the church isn't going to recognize the marriage as being valid. Uh, we recognize sometimes for someone who's left the faith that can can be difficult to understand, mm -hmm. but these are laws that do um, that we are obliged to follow, and they're there for our good. So it's important that we that we do what we can to follow those laws. Yeah. Uh, now, if if a person had, let's say, an outdoor wedding, but it was a Catholic marriage, mm -hmm. which typically wouldn't be the case if if both are Christians, if they're both Christians, and say a Catholic and a Protestant are getting married, it's typically going to be in a, a church setting, whether it's in the Catholic church or in a Protestant community. Mm -hmm. um, but if, but there have, there are sometimes weddings where a Catholic will marry a non-Christian and it'll be allowed for that to be outdoors. Mm -hmm. If that was the situation, then I would say that that's not a problem. Um, but by and large, it seems like it's people fallen away Catholics who are just ignoring the laws of the church, so it does become a problem. Mm -hmm. Could you address uh, the issue of divorced Catholics and receiving Holy Eucharist? So okay. I imagine there's a number of nuances in all of that, but if I'm Catholic, I'm divorced, can I receive the Eucharist, or Catholic divorced, 
remarried, you know, th those kind of issues. Yeah, big questions from the synod, the recent synod. And if a Catholic is divorced, but not remarried, that of itself is not necessarily an obstacle to receiving communion. A Catholic, uh, the, the Catechism of the Catholic Church mentions there are times when a Catholic can be an, an innocent victim of a divorce, really. Mm -hmm. uh, and there are times that a divorce can be necessary when, um, you know, to protect assets, to to settle custody issues, these types of things. So just being divorced of itself is not necessarily an obstacle to receiving the Eucharist and being able to go to confession. It's not necessarily an occasion of sin. It doesn't have to be. Uh, many times it may be. Mm -hmm. But when a Catholic is divorced and has gone and remarried outside the church, hasn't received an annulment from the church, and he gets married outside the church, apart from the church, he puts himself in a situation of ongoing sin, perpetual sin, at least uh, objectively, mm -hmm. he's living in a sinful situation. He may not recognize it, and may not ultimately be culpable, but just since it's objectively a sinful situation, it's not to approach uh, the sacrament as long as, you know, just like when we go to confession, we need to be prepared to amend our lives mm -hmm. and not sin like that again. Uh, if a Catholic who is remarried outside the church after a divorce without an annulment, goes to, to confession, a priest couldn't absolve the sins mm -hmm. w uh, if the Catholic's going to continue to mm -hmm. live as though he's married mm -hmm. without rectifying the situation. Mm -hmm. what, what a lot of Catholics don't know, Jim, is that paragraph 1650 in the Catechism of the Catholic Church already addresses this issue. And it does mention that when Catholics are, if a Catholic is in a situation like that, um, if he lives... Uh, as brother and sister, mm -hmm. basically, right. uh, with with his spouse until the situation is resolved, then of course he can return to the sacraments, go mm -hmm. to confession, and receive the Eucharist. He's got, to, he's got to make a choice, and I think that's really the only valid moral choice to make. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. Well, we have another email. Can divorced and remarried Catholics really be expected to live <laughs> as brother and sister with their new spouse? Mm -hmm. This is a hard teaching to accept, especially if I'm very confident that the church will grant me an annulment. I would be, it would be very ironic if my new marriage suffered because the old one isn't dissolved yet. And this is Max from Pennsylvania. Well, it goes back to, I would say, our, our primary relationship, the most important relationship in our lives must be our relationship with our Creator, must mm -hmm. be our relationship with God. Mm -hmm. We need to always put not only my relationship, but I need to put this other person who I love, mm -hmm. my, my wife, or even if she's not uh, my wife in, in the eyes of the church, but right. my wife civilly, this person who I love, I need to put her salvation first. And one of the ways to do that is to stop right. that objective situation of sin, mm -hmm. put that on hold, Wait until that can be shared in a moral way, in a way that, that is really joyful and rejoicing mm -hmm. in, in the relationship. Uh, and the church is here to help people in those right. situations. So, an annulment does not dissolve a marriage. It simply looks at what appeared to be a marriage and to determine is this a marriage or not. Was it a marriage on the day of the wedding or did a marriage not come into existence? If a marriage did not come into existence, and there are a lot of reasons why that can be, then the church will declare that first marriage null, mm -hmm. and that'll open the door for that new marriage then to be blessed by the church, to be made valid, convalidated by the church, and and that would be then the time to start rejoicing in that in that marriage. But Jim, don't you think like a lot of times in people's lives? I mean, the biggest obstacle is the authority. Like it's really submitting, surrendering, being humble and coming to the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords saying, somebody's in charge and it ain't me. And don't you think that's the biggest obstacle is pride and, and surrender to saying, no, I'm, no, God's just going to have to bless this because this is what I did. And like we get, all get to change the rules. You know, Scripture tells us that we need to be like children. Mm -hmm. We need to be like children in our faith. And we're, we're children of God and we need to trust what he has taught us and what he's taught us through the apostles and through the church. We need to be like children in, in that regard. Um, you know, Jesus, before he ascended into heaven, he said, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given to me. And he breathed on the apostles, the, those first representatives of the church, first hierarchy of the church. He breathed on them and he, he said, receive this authority. Mm -hmm. He gave them 
that authority. So when we're hearing this from the church, because the hierarchy of the church today are the successors to those apostles, mm -hmm. when we're hearing what they're teaching, we're hearing Christ. Jesus right. said, he who hears you hears me. Right. So we need to be listening to yeah. that mm -hmm. and, and recognize that is legitimate authority. Right. And it's about conversion there. Sure. I mean, we've all been in different places in our lives regarding many issues, and whether it's relational issues, sexual relationships, and so on. But it really, and that could be in and outside of marriage yes. in terms of sexuality and so on. But, um, and that, that was one of my struggles. You know, I had left the Catholic Church. Um, it didn't leave me, but I left it for a number mm -hmm. of years and got involved in other expressions of the church, which were, you know, a lot of good things happen in those. And people often, and then I returned back home to the Catholic mm -hmm. faith and um, asked, you know, well, why did you leave the church? You know, why did you leave the Catholic church? And when they first asked me that when I left, you know, I, I don't know what my answer was, but as I pondered that, I said, you know why I left, I think, it's because I wasn't converted. Now, I was born again by water and the Spirit, yeah. you know, my infant baptism. And there's a conversion that takes place by God's grace and mercy. But it's like the Jewish children that are bar mitzvah, you know, that own the Torah, own the law. That's what confirmation is, I guess. And But if you're just going through it, ritual, ceremony, and not, there has to come a time, and maybe every day, you know, where we're converted to the, that's a beautiful thing. Yes. But I didn't know that I had to give myself to the Lord in every aspect of my life. He's Lord of everything. I think that's what you're addressing. And so sometimes it could be outright rebellion. Sometimes it's just ignorance that nobody really said, you know, mm -hmm. you need to respond. Right. And because when somebody told me I needed to respond, I thought that was a novel idea. I said, why do I have to respond? He's the Lord. He's God. What does he want from me? He doesn't need anything from me. And he doesn't. But he desires a relationship. And I think this is what, and once we do that, then it's just, you know, what Jesus said, my food is to do the will of my Father. Yes. And if we're there, then we're going to submit to Christ, to the teaching of Holy Scripture, to the teaching of sacred tradition. But it's a matter of conversion. A lot of times it, it, it is. It really, it really is. And, you know, we have, we suffer, all of us, from a human nature mm -hmm. that is, has, a, has suffered since the fall. And, and we can be helped to, mm -hmm. uh, out of that fallen state, right. uh, you know, ultimately through salvation, but even in this life, by, by listening to <laughs> legitimate authority mm -hmm. and embracing it mm -hmm. and, and realizing that what I think on my own might not always be right, might mm -hmm. not always be the correct answer to something, but I, it's wonderful we have an authority that we can go to who can help us with that. That's this right. area though, human relationship and sexuality mm -hmm. is like the linchpin and last stronghold, I think, for humanity. We're all there, we're all invested with, you know, sexuality, and I think that's where the ultimate authority comes in. What am I going to do here, <laughs> you yeah. know, in, in there? And so, Yield. You know, all of us need to yield. We need to yield every day in our relationship to make it chaste and pleasing as faithful married couples. So we have to live this, whether we're single or widowed or divorced or whatever it is. What does it mean to be wedded to the Lord at this point in my life? Joe, we have a phone call. Okay, we have Ruth from Tennessee. Ruth, welcome to At Home with Jim and Joy. Your question or your comment for Jim? Thanks for taking my question. Um, I want to become a true Christian. I've been watching EWTN, and I want to become a Catholic. But um, I'm afraid I, my past is so bad that the church wouldn't accept me. Um, I have four prior marriages, and th three ended in divorce, and one ended in an illegal annulment because he was married to someone else in another state. Um, what what can I do about this so that the church might accept me? We are so glad that you called and that you would share with us today. And I think we have good news for you about the Catholic faith. Absolutely. You know, there's nothing so great that we can do or so terrible that we can do that God can't forgive that. Amen. Uh, God is, is uh, all, infinitely more powerful than we are. Mm -hmm. uh, so we're just not capable. Of, the only thing we can do to not be forgiven by God is, is to not repent of, of our sins. Mm -hmm. But when, when we come to God, when we come to the church, uh, truly sorry for our sins and wanting to amend our lives, God's always mm -hmm. going to forgive us like, mm -hmm. like a father. Uh, four marriages, all of them it sounds like have ended, whether it be through divorce or annulment. Uh, so the caller, I, 
it sounds to me like right now is not mm -hmm. living in a life as though she's married. So that would not be an obstacle. She, mm -hmm. she would not need to even worry about those unless she wants to be available to get married, you know, maybe try it a fifth time mm -hmm. down the road. Mm -hmm. But if that's not what she's looking at, if she's just simply uh, living an, an unmarried life now and wants to continue living that way, uh, she can come to the church, she can be forgiven for her sins, she can uh, embrace the sacramental life of the church fully. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, it's just a beautiful thing. Well, I, Ruth beautiful. should go to a priest, right? She should go sure. see her local priest and, and go in and explain her situation and, and let him lead her and guide her on that journey. Yeah. If you're ready Absolutely. to yield in mm -hmm. every way to Christ and to the authority that he's placed in the church, you can come into the Catholic Church. So we don't want people to think, oh, I've done all this and that. I can never become Catholic. If you're willing to submit what the church teaches, there may be some restrictions there. But I don't know of a restriction that says you can't become Catholic. No. If you want to submit to Christ, to the church, to the Holy Father's you know, authority within the church. So we want you to know that. Our email address is jimandjoy at ewtn, jimandjoy at ewtn.com, right? Oh, yeah. And, and so please, we want to follow up with you so that you can find a local you know, priest and, and church where you are, and we want you to continue down that road of coming into the church fully. Okay, well, we have Diane from California. Diane, welcome to At Home with Jim. Enjoy your question or your comment for Jim. Yes, um, Jim, I'm struggling with a, a new, a new um, a, a wave thing that's happening out here in California, and that is that a lot of people, including two of my brothers and my husband's cousin, uh, are getting certified off the internet and marrying people. Um, one of my brothers is a fallen away Catholic. He, he never baptized his children, so I understand that. But my other brother is a practicing Catholic that attends Mass weekly, and he, he got, he got a, a certificate off the internet and married a couple out in the, the hills somewhere. And, and when I tell you know people, I, like my father or my mother, when I speak to them about this, they act like, well, that's the way it is. Everybody's doing that. Well, mm. Thank you so much for sharing. So is this okay? Well, the, 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 only, the only people who are obliged to uh, the Catholic form of marriage are Catholics. So if you have one or two Catholics getting married, uh, you know, a Catholic and a non-Catholic or two Catholics getting married, then that form, that required form comes into play. But when you, we have non-Catholics marrying each other, even non-Christians marrying each other, then uh, the, the church doesn't oblige them to any particular form. It can be even the civil form, mm -hmm. or it can be their own religious form. The church is going to recognize that as valid. Uh, so it can be okay, even for a Catholic, to uh, have to gain some sort of authority civilly to uh, witness those unions for the state, for example, mm -hmm. and be, uh, be a witness to those weddings and, and, and marry those people, so to speak, that, that uh, can, can be a legitimate option. Now, if, if a Catholic uh, then, let's say he has that civil authority to witness weddings, but then Catholics come to him, or at least one of the couple come to him, he would need to refer that to the church. That's, he wouldn't have the authority because he cannot um, go by the form of the, of the wedding that the church would require. Mm -hmm. okay. Let's take another email. Okay, our next email. Recently, a family member with whom I'm very close has gotten engaged, and I feel uncomfortable attending the wedding because I don't really approve of the relationship. And I have been, they, I know they have been cohabitating for several years, playing house as I like to call it. And the wedding seems to be only a formality in order to get gifts and money from family and friends. Mm -hmm. From my conversations with her, she has no intention on having children. And despite already being in their 30s, she's not Catholic, but her motives and actions are very much against my beliefs. I feel that I'm go if I feel like that by going to the wedding. I am approving of her behavior. I don't want to hurt the familial relationship and burn a bridge, though. What can I do? This is Lauren. I would say, Lauren, there's not just a one easy answer to this, uh, and I, I would encourage, and I encourage anyone dealing with situations like this to seek spiritual direction. Contact your local parish, your pastor. Seek spiritual direction. Spend some time going over these types of issues. But 
one way to look at, at Lauren's uh, situation is this couple uh, are going from cohabiting mm -hmm. to potentially legitimately being married. That's a good journey. That's a good right. step. Mm -hmm. and, and so it could be that this is fixing something. Right. It might be one way to look at it. And it may be, maybe not in every case, especially if one of the uh, couple is Catholic mm -hmm. and they're not getting married in the Catholic Church. That's, that's a different story. Mm -hmm. But if these are two non-Catholics, they're cohabiting and they're going to make it legal, uh, I, I can see how you might look at that and say, hey, this is a good thing. I want to support this. Mm -hmm. uh, but seek spiritual direction. There may be other reasons to say, well, I don't want to support this. And that's, um, that's something a spiritual director can help with. Okay. We have Catherine from California. Catherine, your question or comment for Jim. Well, good morning and Merry Christmas. Uh, I have a daughter who was married in the church. She and her husband were both Catholics. Well, several years later, she finds out that he was already married. Hmm. Well, she got his divorce for him, but down the line, she ended up divorcing him. And I told her, go get your church annulment. Is this necessary? Okay. Thank you for your question. Yeah, now, so he... She found out later that he was had, a married had man. A so she marriage. got a divorce, yeah. mm -hmm. and I think what she's saying is, wouldn't you want to get that annulled, and not only a divorce, but have it annulled because he was married yeah. before? Yeah, I, and I would say not. It, she would want to get an annulment, seek an annulment, um, if she's looking to remarry. If she's looking to go on and marry someone else, then yes. If not, then an, an annulment's not necessary in a case okay. like that. It's it took us. There was a situation she thought was a marriage come to find out it wasn't because he had not disclosed prior marriage. Mm -hmm. He wouldn't be capable of marrying her if he was married to someone else. Right. So uh, she would no longer view this as a marriage. An annulment wouldn't be necessary. If she finds out uh, that she, she wants to go and, and potentially get married in the future, it may be very easy to handle this. It may not be a full annulment process. It may be a, a process that just requires uh, documentation of what's happened here. Mm -hmm. He was already married uh, and then he attempted to marry me and the, the church can, in situations like that, sometimes uh, render a quick decision. Jim, mm -hmm. do you go out to for invitations, churches, other places to speak and to address various topics? Absolutely. Uh, parish talks, uh, conferences, retreats, uh, you name it. I'm, I'm, uh, I, I've even gone to very personal situations. I, uh, there was a an elderly w woman one time who had a, uh, for her birthday, she wanted to have an apologist come <laughs> and, and sit with the family and How just, just talk about these that? things. How great is that? I, I uh, and I love A clearing love house it, with so. your brain. <laughs> Best <laughs> way wonderful. to reach you. Best way to reach you. Best way to, way to reach me if, if, if you'd like website, to have me come out and, and speak, yeah. go to catholic.com, look for Jim Blackburn there. Um, I, I do, I'm on Facebook, I'm mm -hmm. on LinkedIn. Uh, just look up my name and you'll find mm -hmm. me. Wonderful. Thanks, well, it was wonderful to have you with us, Thank and you. I hope he cleared up some of your answers. But if you have more, you can always go to his website and get in touch with Jim Blackburn. We're going to take a break, and when we come back, we'll be back with Father John Paul, who will bring more clarity to the subject. Don't go away. Well, you are an important part of the family, and guess what? You could come see us live. You could come to At Home with Jim and Joy. All you need to do is contact the EWTN Pilgrimage Department. Go to the great website, pilgrimages at EWTN.com, or call 205-271-2966. Come on down and take a beautiful spiritual pilgrimage of EWTN. Go to the shrine in Hansville, come up with a busload of church people, come all by yourself. However you like to travel, we would love to see you. So come on down. Well, Father John Paul, welcome back. And I'm, I'm glad back. you're feeling better. Yeah, yeah. And Antibiotics are a great med, eh? <laughs> Thanks be to God. Well, yeah. we, have, 
We have good doctors here in Birmingham First to take prayer, care of you. then antibiotics. Of course. There you yeah. go. Well, good. I sat in bed for a few days, Bless but your heart. I'm better. It's no I'm fun better. being sick. Well, you in Birmingham, Bir Birmingham's not good for allergies. Yeah. So. But not that good. has nothing to do with the show. No. <laughs> well, Jim uh, was wonderful, Jim Blackburn. I mean, just all the <coughs> answers that he had, and I mean, that's what he does sure. all the time, answering all the questions and really feeling sure. called to the marriage, annulment, divorce question. But at the same time, it's important that Jim said, you know, it's like something we should all be doing. And mm -hmm. I think that's important because you hear a guy like that or you go to Catholic Answers, and thank God for these amazing yes. puzzles. Sure. But, you know, we we kind of think like, well, priests, you know, they're celebrating the sacraments, and then we got Jim Blackburn to do apologetics. But all of us have to be ready to give an answer for the hope that is. Well, that's us. right. That's exactly what I was just going to say. That Jim even said that too. He yeah. quoted First uh, Peter three fifteen. I think it is always be ready to give a reason for the hope that dwells within you. Mm -hmm. And what is the hope that dwells within us is the truth, the truth about Jesus Christ, the truth that He established a church. Uh, that has existed for 2,000 years, and the church is the rock uh, upon which we could uh, build our faith, yeah. um, the cornerstone mm -hmm. uh, that Jesus Christ built in, uh, the extension of his body, the church. Mm -hmm. I was talking with a family member who's really an outstanding Christian, <clears throat> not necessarily Catholic, but really devoted and trying to obey everything that he knows. And it was interesting, we had this conversation. Uh, he was He was saying that he was on the job site and some guy came on who was working with the crew and he was you know sharing about his christian faith to somebody else and this family member was listening to it and he didn't know if he should say something or not but he was trying to determine what he was going to say based upon is this an essential question or, or conversation sure. or is it a non-essential and i thought it was really interesting when he raised that issue because it it opened the door really to say, well, how do we decide what's essential and not essential? How are you going to determine that versus me as a Catholic determining what is essential? Do I just look to the Bible and say, it seems to me these 20 things are essential, these aren't, versus the way we would do that as Catholics? I would certainly say that, you know, in the context of this year of mercy, um, instructing the ignorant is a work of mercy. Mm. And like Father Mitch said the other day on the show with uh, Father Michael Gately, ignorance is not bliss. Right. Mm -hmm. You know, it's not a good thing. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, we're made for the truth. Mm -hmm. We're wired for the truth. And, um, you know, another work of mercy is admonishing sinners. Mm -hmm. And this doesn't mean that, you know, we come down with our fists, right? Right. <laughs> you know, uh, when we see people f perhaps falling into sin, we, we see a, a mem even a member in our family, a situation that we come down heavy. You know, mm -hmm. Jesus never did that, right. mm -hmm. you know, in the gospel. I mean, look, you know, thank God. Uh, I just love that caller, Ruth. Right. You know, I just mm -hmm. wanted to en mm -hmm. encourage Ruth. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, when I heard her call, uh, when I heard uh, just... You know, the, the, the email, um, or no, she called, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, just, you know, her expressing her, um, her desire to come into the church, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, her desire to, you know, really to encounter Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I was, I was pr praying about that the last couple minutes and just, you know, think about the Samaritan woman. Right. You know, at the well. Mm -hmm. um, now, now, obviously, you know, maybe not, she's not in the same circumstances as that Samaritan woman. But really, that Samaritan woman um, pretty much identifies every single one of us. Mm -hmm. You know, every single one of us comes to that well mm -hmm. or, you know, that, that well, you know, that, that whole scene with the Samaritan woman and Jesus where Jesus reveals to that woman her present state mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. of sin, mm -hmm. you know, the present circumstances. He did not do that to really condemn her, but he, he did that to set her, know, free. Set her free. Mm -hmm. You know, he mm -hmm. did it as an act of mercy mm -hmm. to lift her mm -hmm. out of, um, you know, that, you know, the life that she was living. And, you know, when, when Jesus said to the woman, um, you know, I'm thirsty, mm -hmm. I always love to meditate upon that. And just to really to, to ask the question, do you, do you think that Jesus was thirsty, you know, just, you know, right. for a drink of water? Mm -hmm. You know, give me a drink of water. 
You know, he was thirsty for that woman's faith. Right. Mm-hmm. You know, and, and that woman, um, you know, the woman that called in, Ruth, I, I, I can't help but think that that's what she desires. Mm-hmm. You know, she desires, you know, that truth of Jesus Christ, you know, and the truth that has been passed down to us in a church. You know, that's what she really desires. Right. And that beauty of saying, she was so wonderful and honest and just saying, you know, this is what I've done and and maybe maybe there is more because, look, I did this four times and maybe I shouldn't have done it this way. Maybe there was a better way. Maybe there there was a way to do this. And I want to come into a church where the arms are wide open to me and going to embrace me with truth and authority. Well, I couldn't help but think, you know, if there's one person that asks the question, Ruth, there's another person. That's right. That mm-hmm. has asked the question. Mm-hmm. You know, you're not the only one. Right. You know, out there. There's many people out there in your circumstances or other circumstances too. You know, we're not cookie cutters, you know, right. everybody has different circumstances, right. different pains in life that but you know, thank God, you know, reach out to your pastor. Mm-hmm. Reach out mm-hmm. to uh, the church. The church is a like for, Pope Francis would say a, a hospital for sinners. That's right. You know, uh, we're not the church of the Latter day Saints, mm-hmm. we're the church of the modern mm-hmm. day sinners. Mm-hmm. Father, with that you know, thought, would you give us some water from heaven through your blessing? Sure. Mm-hmm. Family, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he turn his face to you and be merciful to you. May he show you his kindness and give you his peace. And may the blessing of Almighty God, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, descend upon you and remain with you forever. Amen. 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 God bless you. God bless all of your loved ones. Thank you for being with us on At Home with Jim and Joy. Bye now.